making your way in the world today it takes everything you got to get a break from all your worries sure would mean a lot and I guess we really like to get away sometimes you want to go where everybody First, it's like intimidating, you know. It's like all these people are kind of like, you know, look a little weird. And I was like, what is this crazy place? These people are so much cooler than I've ever seen people before. There was so much smoke in there, you could barely see through the room. Just the whole vibe and aesthetic immediately was like, oh, okay. Like the shitty linoleum, the plastic cups, the cowboy booth. It was shitty, but it was in the right kind of shitty, you know? The Union is the best rock and roll club in the world. Go to the club and you'll understand. This place is disgusting. It's loud. It's gross. Awesome. It's just a weird place for weird people. I've met some of my best friends there. It was really blown out. And it was packed. Older people watching this loud, crazy, hardcore bands. Everybody came out, everybody got shit-faced, and everybody danced. It was an amazing time. We all felt so good together. Your feet stuck to the floor when you went, and then you went, and everyone was headbanging and shoving everyone. I remember, like, pulling my pants down and sticking my fingers in my butt. You're looking around at people like, are you seeing this? Yeah. Uh. My jeans were so wet with sweat, it felt like I had pissed my pants. It was like 95 degrees in the upstairs. And there are people getting blowjobs in the bathroom and practically humping on stage. I've definitely seen some things in the union that I cannot unsee. <laughs> that will haunt me, but also make me laugh and smirk, probably for, you know, for the rest of my life. <laughs> My impression, it's always been, you know, sort of like the clubhouse. The place where you run into some of the other, you know, movers and shakers, if you will, you know, the folks who are sort of involved in the local scene. Always seem to run into, you know, somebody I hadn't seen for a good long time there and catch up. That was my go-to place when I'd have a band I was working with making a record. We went out, and, you know, we'd take them out and just kind of show them Athens. The, the Union was always the first stop. So many times I like, you could walk into that place and didn't know everyone, you'd walk out and you'd have three new friends. This is a place where the town meets the college pretty well. It's not kind of segregated like a lot of other establishments in town. Even if it's a, it was an art opening downstairs with some food, it opened its arms to college students as well as locals. It didn't really matter that so-and-so was a professor and so-and-so was a hippie and so-and-so was a, a punk rap kid. Like, we, we were all just, we were all just chilling and, and, and enjoying being where we were. It was, it was a, a family. It was a space where we were all at home and we were comfortable and we were safe and we were having a fucking blast all the time. We were all of an island of misfit toys and we, we all fit together and felt good there. My dad had gone to 
OU in the 60s, there was a shirt that had all the names of the bars that used to be uptown. And the only one that was there from the time he was there was the Union. So it was definitely the kind of cockroach of bars in Athens. It just wouldn't die. It definitely is one of the classic names, and, and it's one of the most recognizable names if you have a, a uh, alumni from even the 1960s, you'll know exactly what you're talking about. It started out as a hotel, and it was the Elks Hotel. And it's amazing to think that there were probably 20 hotel rooms in that small building by modern standards at least. And the rooms were 12 by 12 maybe, and there'd be entire families. And this is like in the Depression era. It was open during Prohibition. They may have been illegally serving alcohol during the Prohibition, which I like to think is true, that the Union still, like, as, as an entity was a bit of a, it was a bit rebellious. When the building was first constructed in the early 1900s, it was very close to the train station at the foot of West Union Hill. And so it was a natural place for uh, visitors to Athens to walk up the hill and stay at a hotel and get something to eat. As the university expanded, and especially after the GI Bill in the post-World War II era, there are more students. The Elk Hotel catered more to students in the 1940s. The downstairs, likely due to the clientele, the bar part really took off, as did the, the 10 cent hot dogs that the place was known for for so many years. When I first came to college, the Union was kind of like the beatnik bar. That was almost before hippies, and it quickly turned into the hippie bar, and it also was always considered to be a towny bar. But the Union quickly became my favorite place to hang out. At this particular time, Stroh's beer was extremely popular, and it had just gone from 35 cents to 37 cents. Lunch was a very big deal at the Union back in those days, and they had this famous secret hot dog sauce recipe. A uh, cheap and quality meal and a lot of people working um, for the university in uptown Athens would, would go there and buy, buy themselves five hot dogs. And you were always meeting new people that had a solid history with the union. There was this lady that came in and she was in her 70s and the union was her very first job. And so I was like, welcome home, you know, what can I get you? And she, and she said a shot of whiskey, sweetie. And we took a shot of whiskey together, the 70 year old lady, who had, and it had been her first job at the union. And you kind of got that a lot. It's just been a showcase for local rock and roll. Great room to play in. Best, one of the best bars I've ever been in as far as rock and roll, punk rock. I think just the age of the room itself and all of the crazy shit that's happened there, you could almost feel it in there. Like, you know, you could feel that there had been all those rock and roll shows there. And, just had a different mindset when they were there like no one like sat and crossed their hands and watched them. like everyone was like involved physically a lot of the time 
I had permanent bruises right below my knees for like three years because I was always posted up right by the stage of the union. People at the union are, they're there to let go and uh, it's a special thing. It, it leads to better performances, it leads to, you know, camaraderie. There's like a sense of community and when you know when you get to play there, you know, there's a a sense of being being part of something happening. It's like, wow, we go to a show that that person they did freaking awesome. Like I wanna start doing stuff like that. It's like they're doing awesome. I wanna do awesome. Like, it just made me wanna go home and practice. One, two, three, four. I just felt like the minute I stepped above those risers, like you just felt like, you know, you're sharing a stage with not only like really fucking excellent contemporaries, but people who have played there in the past. For me, that, that meant a lot. If I grew up here and I started playing music here, I don't know why, why would I ever leave? Because there's, so much going on in such a small place. One thing that really hooked me was when I first started playing in bands in high school, and I wound up like contacting Scott Finlan about, you know, we want to play here, we're just kids, how do we do this, can we play a show, can we like open up for somebody? He wasn't making any money off of it, but he saw the significance and having this place continue. And that was always really something that stuck with me and basically what made me feel so drawn to that place and always want to be a part of it. Seems like all it really takes to make a scene cohere is one person who just cares an incredible amount about bringing culture in and being sort of a curator and involving other people and, and getting people out. I was exposed to so much music at the Union that, that I would have never heard of before. I could just name band after band after band. And that I ended up becoming huge fans of and then also got to play with and meet and become friends with a lot of people. Like one of the coolest shows I ever saw there was Tyler Keith and the Preacher's Kids and I'd never even heard of them before. It was like having a religious experience. one of the few spots in, in Athens in particular that you can see a, you know, a, a hip hop slash spoken word show one night and the next night there's, you know, some rock and roll going on. The next night there could be a comedy show or a Rocky Horror Picture show or something like that. We did everything. I've mic'd a suitcase before. I would say the union is part of the reason there is a good music scene in Athens. I think it helped the town grow. It, it put it on the map. I mean, it made people realize not just Ohio University was here, but it was a stopover point. I mean, I've heard tons of people. I've been in LA and people said, oh, Athens, Ohio? Yeah, the Union played there, you know? So, I mean, that's the first thing they said. lot of really great bands come through that you know on their on their way up from whether it was you know my favorite the Jesus Lizard or the White Stripes or the Black Keys or bands that are you know massive now 
all rolled through here multiple times and played here, and, and the same smoky, loud, sweaty, you know, shitty, shitty club. The summer after my freshman year, and I was just getting a band together with a couple buddies of mine, and uh, we played a show there. I don't know. I think that's the first first moment where I felt like I was starting to become part of something. We went by a uh, whale zombie, and uh, we played there sometimes as much as like twice a week. Pretty much whatever whatever show that uh, Scott Winland offered, Chris Lute, he went ahead and said yes to it to an exhausting level sometimes. So. Being upstairs in the Union became a pretty frequent thing for me. One thing that's like, you know, very pinnacle uh, thing each year for the Union is Blackout Fest. That's a crazy party. I mean, it's, it's three days in a row of just nonstop music. There was a Blackout Fest one year with this band, uh, The Anomalies. Partway through their set, they came from a stage all the way across the bar. I'm sorry, my mic drops. I think it's... Mm. Say please. Chris Todd, take two. Everybody got up on top of the bar and started playing all the way across the room. And like they finished their set out on top of the bar playing like while we're bartending. So one of the things that the union does really well is reoccurring festivals. And then the end all be all is Blackout Fest. People would come back from out of town. That's one of those weekends where it's like, oh, I haven't been to Athens for a while. I don't think I've danced harder or moved my body as much as, as for, for such extended periods of time as during some of those nights of Blackout Fest. It just felt like the entire room was jumping up and down in unison. And uh, every time somebody fell down, somebody would you know grab them and, and pick them, you know, pull them up from the floor. And people were like falling down onto the stage, and everybody was just sort of dancing and writhing. And I like I had like mascara on me from like bumping heads with a girl, and I just like walked out of there drenched in beer, you know, you know, stinking of cigarette smoke, and like not even my own sweat, but just the sweat of strangers. I got punched in the face at Blackout Fest one time. That was pretty cool. I was drunk and having fun, and I'd smash my hand on a bottle and was bleeding, but I was feeling no pain. Scott does such a good job of lining up so many good bands back to back to back to back to back to back to back, to back that you are so musically exhausted by the end of the weekend because you've absorbed all of this really just insane goodness. It was like the best music Black holiday Fest was of the Christmas. year. Yeah, Blackout yeah. Fest was Christmas. It was great. <laughs> And yeah, you would you would start off really strong and you know energized, and by the end of the weekend, yeah, your ears would be ringing, you would be exhausted. You need and just, a weekend off, or you need a couple right. days off to recover from just the, trying from to the like, weekend. Yeah, just trying to get through it almost. But those some of those out of town bands that we all loved that would all come together for like three nights of just bliss. <laughs> Everybody who had bands in the area would just drink as much as they could and then attempt to play their set after drinking that much. And it was kind of like whoever could actually pull it off was kind of the winner, but it doesn't matter because everybody's just getting fucked up. But So hence Blackout Fest. It was like, you know, get Blackout drunk and see if you can still play your guitar. But the first one, yeah, was Booze Fest, for sure. And it was literally like Blackout Fest. It was like, oh, how many did you black out? I guess, I don't know, whatever. Uh, it was pretty sloppy and pretty irresponsible, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I guess my thing is it's important to recognize that, yes, it started out as this dumb, silly party, but then it turned into this really cool thing. To be included even in like the worst time slot at the Blackout Fest, for me, has always been like to see your name amongst like some of the best national and regional acts, or at least the fucking coolest, was always totally worth it. 
Rat Brains opened the first day, which I like to me that I was it was like the bee's knees to me. Like that was so cool. It was like we and then they made the shirts that year, and it was the first year they didn't put the fucking bands on the back of the shirt. And that's why I wanted to play it back out fast. I wanted my band's name on the back of that fucking shirt. It never ended up happening. I'll never forgive Scott for that. The show was wrapping up, and I was shit-faced. And I was stumbling down the stairs. And as I walked, turned to walk into the corner bar, I heard a song, and I was like, the song sounds really familiar. And as I turned the corner, I was like, oh yeah, it's one of my songs. And I like came around the corner and, I, and everybody was sitting at the bar and they all turned around to look at me and Speedy was bartending and everybody went, hey! And I was like, hey, you know? And then I just, and I don't think we said anything. I just think like, people came over and just hugged me and we all like hugged and we didn't dance. Or we just sort of like rocked together in a big like amoeba. Evans, County 911, where's your emergency? Hi, we need help, like right now. We're getting smoke off the roof. Our generator on the backside caught on fire, and our entire apartment is filled with smoke right now. The fire department's on their way. Just get everybody out of the building. phone and it's just like uh, I, there's just, I had, had so many messages and missed calls and uh, the first one I saw was from Jerry and he was like he was like it's it's gone like the union it's gone it burnt down and I was like what are you what do you what do you mean we look you know our our ashtray outside is on fire or you know the, the union can't be on fire what do you mean the union's on fire I just felt like this, like, this chill come over me. You know, I'll never forget that, just having been in there, to, you know, just hours before, you know, my, my favorite local rock club, and uh, then having that happen the next day, that definitely made a, you know, huge impression. And we were all gutted by it. I mean, when we heard that the next morning, we were just, we couldn't believe it. And there was a river coming out the front door. And I just was like, oh God. And I, all I could think of was like, all the little things in there that I knew about, I can't do anything about it anymore, you know? And it's like, it's gone. You know, we had done a lot of work in that building and the owners of the building, the owners of the business knew all this stuff and we had taken care of all the things. We had all our ducks in a row. And I had been the contractor, you know, this, I'm making this this much better. We had taken the extra time to make it perfect. You know, make it right. It was such a mess when we first started, when I first started there. I mean, we fixed all that. We made it better. And then in the end, it burns. But tonight, the things are burning bright for all to see. People out of town seem to burn down. Like an underground Seems coming down I can't take on no more water Because it's burning bright One last time And at the time when you first heard about it, you didn't know the building was completely 
trash and would need to be condemned, or it doesn't take much fire to fucking ruin a place, to like make it inhospitable. It was pretty devastated, uh, for sure. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't so sure it was gonna open again when I saw how bad it was, but it's very easy in this town to just turn everything into apartments and housing. So that was, I don't know if it was a battle or not, but it was a concern at least by people who weren't in the know. I really thought about coming right up here, but I remember just being like, I don't think I can do it. That was too sad. I'm, Tearing up now, even just thinking. It was that. really emotional. We, did, really we didn't was really even emotional. come up for a couple days. Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't want to see it. Of course, the days following were really sentimental and nostalgic and depressing because it's kind of like, what do we do now? There were people who lost their jobs that also felt as nostalgic and sentimental about it, but now they're also, they don't even know where they're going to go to work. Honestly, it took about a week for it to set in. You know, I knew that what had happened happened, but it takes, it, like I said, it had been such a consistent, everyday part of my life that, you know, of course I was gonna be going to the union and working that next day or whatever, you know. It, never, it took a while to sink in as far as the job aspect of, of everything, but really what, what struck me the hardest was thinking about all of the amazing memories and people that I've met since, from the time that I've worked here all of it, what the, how much that place had enriched my life in general. The importance of the union, I think, really needs to be remembered through this time. It's important to have a place for people to creatively express themselves. And it's important to have a place where people can call home and people can feel safe and and to be themselves. So let's sing a song to the union. Let's sing a song to the nights when we found hope in confusion. I was doing sound at Casa at the time, so I went in that Sunday for a sound shift and everybody was in there, you know, crying. It was like a funeral and it was someone that just had died. But um, I went in and I told people and I was just like, yo, like, they were like, yeah, the union burned down. I was like, I know, we played there last night and we left all our shit there. Uh, we opened that night. The weird thing about that show for us that was different is our drummer, Eric, he brought his nice pearl drum set down. And the reason why that this survived is I put mine on stage left and everybody else put their stuff on stage right. And so apparently the fire didn't get completely over there. The strap still smells like a burnt campfire. It's like real charry, like hot dog smell. Hill Hackworth and I um, arranged some benefits. We had some at Jack Yo's and Casa. I think we ended up having three overall at Casa. Uh, one of them was for the workers, and the other two were for the rebuilding. Uh, like, every band in town wanted to be a part of that, and so it wasn't hard to try to find people for it. We raised a lot of money. There were a couple community members who started a GoFundMe account to help assist those employees who, were, who no longer were employed because of the, the fire. In Appalachia, Ohio, one of the poorest areas in the nation, people were so willing to give, you know what I mean? It was really awesome to see uh, the outpouring of support from people. And, and really cool that other bars hired our bartenders like right off the bat. And in all in all, we didn't get back everything that we lost or even close to the amount of money, but the fact that the community gave a shit enough to, about us to even like help us out in any kind of way was really cool. The lion's share of like social media content for me was 
just an outpouring of like amazing memories and photos. I got stuck in a picture, me when I was a kid. You know, people you hadn't seen in forever, or people that aren't here anymore. It was this really positive thing, and it was brought together like a whole greater community of people that have been deeply affected by this place. It was this huge community celebration of what the union was to us. And it was every post. And it was a lot of the same sentiments, like where I got to experience great music, you know, where I met most of my friends from that time. We were all this just community of being so sad, so just heart-wrenchingly devastated, but also being like, look at this thing that this dingy, filthy dive bar gave us. It was JJ's birthday, and he was, you know, I felt so bad for the dude. You know, the union is his, his place, like, he's one with that thing, and uh, he was just really upset, and I don't know, it was just terrible. If he didn't show up for happy hour, the bartenders called his house to make sure that he was okay. And I, I just remember thinking about, what the fuck is JJ going to do for happy hour tonight? And just, I remember worrying about the people. Not so much the, the building, but like, a bar didn't burn down. People's home. Like, it was home for so many of us. It was where we figured out how to be the dysfunctional people that we are or how to stop being the dysfunctional people we are depending on who you talk to. It was home, our, ho our home burned down. It affected everybody in different ways, but you all felt this drastic communal loss. We all understood what we had lost. Everybody knows it, felt it, you know, I mean, it's the place where, ah, we all went there after work or something, and now you're like, oh God, it's, it's gone. I mean, they took, it's just part of me is gone. I think that I got everything for myself. It was the first place that I felt like home. You know, it was, <laughs> it was everything. It was where I grew up and became comfortable with myself. You know, I'm not a religious man, but I feel blessed to have been, you know, a part of the union and, and, and and all the people I, I met in, at the Union in Athens and like there, I mean, the coolest fucking people in the world. It's a great relief to know that we are surrounded by a community, both locally and nationally, that doesn't want to see it die. You know what I mean? So it's a, I appreciate everybody's support um, and I hope to see everybody in the Union again sooner than later. celebration at Casa while the union was in the process of being rebuilt. And I said, where the fuck am I? This place doesn't exist in Ohio. I met my wife there. I asked my wife out there. I asked my wife to marry me there. And I actually have the corner of the union bar where I asked her out. Toughest year of my life. I get back to town and uh, it's Thanksgiving and uh, feeling really bad. I hear the union's open. I go to the union. And it's just a beautiful evening. I was accepted, I was welcome, and uh, I knew I'd live to fight another day. So, Union. I never liked death metal. And then I went to a skeleton witch show at the Union, and I suddenly loved it. I'm a
have been playing shows at that establishment for over half of my life, and it's been an honor and a privilege to do that. My first show there was weeks before my 16th birthday, and I really fucking appreciate everything Scott Woodland did to like help us, and especially the youth in Athens at the time, do stuff like this. It wasn't just a fucking bar, ladies and gentlemen. It was our living room. It was it was our like home, you know. That's it, it means a lot. I can't wait to see it come back, and I'm really glad you're all out here tonight. Thanks. Even though their entire livelihood burned down, they were there to celebrate my birthday. Even though I was pretty much nothing, I was just a guy that really liked to go to their bar. They did nothing but they, they were right there with, a, with birthday gifts and everything because they're awesome people and that's the kind of place that we are celebrating right now because it, it, it is, it's more than the music, it's, it's, it's the people. It's more than the place, it's the people. It's the union. It's the most beautiful thing that I've ever had in my 32 years. That's my, I love that place. I love those people and they made me feel so good. driving on the street and there's just nothing there and going in and taking pictures and it's just gutted. Like that was more, that was the toughest part, I think, you know, just getting used to the fact that it wasn't there. And there was this kind of weird inkling you would get walking uptown where you're like, you, your body almost just like immediately just sort of veers that way and you're like, fuck, like we can't go to the union. I always, just in my heart of hearts, I always thought that it was going to be rebuilt. I, you know, it's just too, too important uh, part of this town's history and its cultural milieu. It's, it's a, you know, the the outpouring of emotion that accompanied in the aftermath of the fire was was indicative of that. I mean, it's just, um, I, I just could not see it not being rebuilt. Any big project like that always takes a lot longer than you thought. And furthermore, if you rush things too much, you screw stuff up. So I'm actually kind of glad that they're taking their time and doing things right. And I'm sure it'll be completely different because from a viewpoint of, you know, making a few dollars, they've got to make some changes to make things work better. And obviously you can make it a lot bigger because there's an awful lot of dead space in the old arrangement of the union. Uh, I ended up joining the construction crew and helping them uh, rebuild it. And I mean, we dug the downstairs bar to a dirt floor and uncovered a cistern. I mean, that's how, that's how deep the, the, the rebuild was. It was, we were down to the earth. So I knew it was gonna be a long time before this place could get open again. I mean, yeah, it was silly, but it was almost like comical. It was just like, who, whoever built it is just like, the one place where you have a support beam is in the middle of the stage. I hit my head on it a couple times. I kind of miss it, just laughing at it and just being like, okay, like, you gotta like, kind of edge yourself to the left or right of it to see the singer. I miss that. I miss, I miss the pillar. I mean, that thing was like, it was one of those things that you just love to hate because it was like you could put your set list there or Colin tried to saws all that thing out of there. 15 years ago and just got like two blades stuck in it and just, those blades probably were probably still there till it burnt down <laughs> because he tried to, uh, people tried to pull that thing out of there and it was like no it's there there's nothing you can do about it and we did like a split show where we used the pillar as like split the stage so we had one band on one side we'd play a song and then the other band would play a song on the other side. So the audience would be looking here, and then they look there, and they look there. 
And that was a really fun show. Playing on there, uh, it was a distraction. <laughs> and seeing shows, it was a distraction too. It was like... I mean, yeah, it was straight in the middle of the stage. And it was hilarious because you could sometimes see like the drunkest one holding onto it. You know, it was like, but you see that person that was like, they couldn't fucking stand up anymore. <laughs> but they had one hand on that pillar and they were right in front of the band, like, you know? <laughs> and, and that was probably me sometimes too. That was my lifeblood, okay? It's just like, it's just there. It's made to swing around. It's you can be like totally sultry with it. You can be totally animalistic with it. It's a wonderful pop and a wonderful aid. Oh, I do, I do miss the pole. It's a, it's a piece of wood, but it's just like ship's math, you know? I don't miss it. Like, I, if anybody says that they've missed that post of lying, like, why, why? Why do you want to post in the middle of the stage? It's fucking dumb. Like, yeah, they're full of shit. After the place burned down, it was really awesome how everybody kind of, like all the other promoters were really supportive and, and the drag about it was, you know, like everywhere you did a show, it wasn't the union, so. Um, and Blackout Fest has only been at the union. I didn't want to have Blackout Fest at Casa or at Jackie O's because that just, I felt like I had to find like, like some kind of neutral weirdo territory so that it wouldn't be like, it wasn't Blackout Fest, you know what I mean? It was the Blackout Bowl. This was like to tide you over. But uh, again, the really awesome other bars in town all kind of chipped in to help cover some of the cost. Uh, and then we still got to have some kind of a, okay, we're not open yet, but Blackout Fest will be happening. And for a long time, I kept hearing, oh, it'll be open, you know, just another month or so. And it was almost, I think I heard that for almost a year. And I never had, you know, some kind of expectation for it to happen quickly or, and yeah, that happened where we kind of thought we might be open sooner. And I think that once we realized that the place wasn't going to be open um, by, the end of April, which I was hoping to do Blackout Fest in April or whatever. It wouldn't make a difference if the students were all gone anyways. Would we, would we open on the, the 5th of May or the 10th of May or the 17th or the end of May? I'm, I'm excited and, and I'm kind of nervous. You know, it's never going to be the old union, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing, but I just, uh, you know, I'm, I want it to just still be... I want to go in and like have it be like cheers. I know it's not going to be like that, but I want to walk in and have it be like, hey, Mark, you know, we'll make you, here's your, here's your PBR for a buck 25 or this or that. You 
John invited us up to the D Race to play to test out the new sound system. Just kind of ran through our set and monkeyed around a little bit and kind of gave us the tour. Stuff was still covered up downstairs. You couldn't see the floor. And I was just blown away about how much bigger they made it. I couldn't believe, you know, how high the stage was, the ceilings, and, and it just seemed generally bigger from front to back. I was just blown away. I was like, how the hell did you guys find all this space? Really? Some feng shui, just take out the drop ceilings and raise the roof. That makes the place a lot bigger, so. That was the first thing that really hit me, and then just kind of looking at everything else, I'm still absorbing how much different it is. It was definitely the busiest. Everyone said it, that it worked here for years. It was the busiest night they'd ever experienced here at the Union. So if that tells you anything about the, the future of the place and how excited you know, the community was and, and people from out of town even were to have it back. Uh, I mean, people came from all over the place. I was really impressed by the lengths some people went to, uh, to attend the reopening of the Union, which was great. Just like everywhere you turned, it was just like, this just like freak family reunion and it was, that was really cool and very comforting because a lot of those people you hadn't seen in the absence. Just seeing it like packed and everything was fine. There were no hiccups or problems, you know, that made things too weird. So yeah, I mean, it was a happy, happy weekend. Hey, what's up, Union people? So it's been a while since we've been up here. Um, good to see all you fucking people. Um, so yeah, we're about to play some music. This is bass. Survived the fucking fire, and I'm really lucky to have it. All of us survived. The bass survived. We're good to go. It's time to play some music. It still has the old vibe, but it's it's new and it's it's fresh. It was surreal. The back patio was surpassed anything I could imagine it. I mean, I mean, it's huge. It was great. It was beautiful. There were a lot of hugs and kisses and uh, smiles and memories and a couple tears here and there. It was still kind of shock, you know, like the whole thing, the whole span of all of it from it burning and then reopening and the whole
process of all that. Just still all unreal. <laughs> There was a moment when the Blam Blams were playing Band on the Run. And, uh, they're right in the middle, or they're getting ready to come into the chorus. at the end of the bar by the door, looking around. It was just, and I, I got, I got a little misty, man. It was really beautiful, and by the time we made it through the course, the power came back on, and it was seamless like they planned it. So that was, that was, that stuck out. And then the rest of it was just a crazy party, like you would imagine. It was awesome. I had a blast that weekend. Yeah, I think I worked Friday night that weekend at Tony's. Might as well not even been open. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, Casa and Tony's were pretty dead. Pretty dead on the other side of town. <laughs> for, a good, for a good couple of weeks. Really technically for months, but those yeah. first couple of weeks it was, yeah. everyone was here every day because they wanted to get as which much was, as they could. Which was kind of. fine because they had all kind of come to us. We had, we had experienced a boom. Is the first place to reopen on that whole block all the money and those other bullshit apartment places there and whatever. The union was the first place to get it together and that how important that place was and is and how they put that on the fast track. I guess I got to say it was it was uh, it was great to finally reach that. You know what I mean? And that everybody was working together and it was actually working and like the staff was working and it was exciting to like go to the first meeting before we opened and get to meet the new people who are working there who are all super cool. So after the long dry spell with no union, the first time you walk in those doors, it was absolutely worth the wait. It was home. It was a cleaner home, but it was home because the music was there, the people were there, the family was there. And it was just, it was right. It was absolutely right. Texas, text Scott. 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 So after the reopen, Scott had been cooking and working on the next Blackout Fest for a while. And once that happened, it was like the final brick was put in the building, and it was rock and roll. And it was exactly the party that it always felt like. It was all of the sweaty, rowdy kids. <laughs> but it felt exactly like it always felt. It felt like old times, and I, I feel like everyone that was there felt that.
looked at it and he said, oh, shit. <laughs> the bitch is back. It's still the union and it still feels great to be home. But it's never going to be exactly the same. It's never going to have the same aesthetic. I love the way that they've set it up. It's a great, it's beautiful facility. Like, it's a still, and once the lights go down and the band starts playing, it's still a badass rock and roll bar. And that's every bit enough for me. <laughs> and I think that that's all that it matters, that there's still good music going on there. There's still good people coming to see good music going on there. And that's, that's what it's all about. Like, it, it is a place for music. 